I saw this study the other day titled Bigotry and the Human-Animal Divide, Disbelief in Human Evolution and Bigoted Attitudes Across Different Cultures. And to be honest, I almost gave this one a pass. Like, sure, I get it. Dumbasses who don't understand evolution are also giant racists. Sure, news at 11. But I'm really glad that I decided to circle back and take a second look because I found something much more interesting than this confirms my own personal beliefs about how terrible religious fundamentalists are. I I mean, yeah, it did also in a way confirm that. But in another way, it articulated something else that I've suspected for some time, but I didn't realize was an active uh, area of research happening in psychology. In essence, animal rights lead to human rights. I know, you probably were not expecting me to go there. Um, You know, that's what I do. I like to keep you on your toes. Smash that subscribe button, everybody. Pound that thumbs up. Obliterate my Patreon to get more of these zany mind fucks. Anyway, these researchers took survey data from about 64,000 people from uh, 45 different countries across eight separate studies, and they found an association between bigotry and lack of understanding of evolution. Now, the researchers call that a belief in evolution, but when talking about obvious facts like evolution or what color the sky is or how cute my dog is, I personally prefer to talk about understanding over belief. So what kind of bigotry did they find? Well, uh, allow me to quote from the study abstract. Low belief in human evolution was associated with higher levels of prejudice, racist attitudes, and support for discriminatory behaviors against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, LGBTQ, blacks, and immigrants in the United States, that's just from study one, with higher in-group biases, prejudicial attitudes toward outgroups, and less support for conflict resolution in samples collected from 19 Eastern European countries, that's study number two, 25 Muslim countries, study number three, and Israel, study number four. Further, among Americans, lower belief in evolution was associated with greater prejudice and militaristic attitudes toward political outgroups. That's from study number five. So far, we're still in that area of confirming why I don't get along with religious fanatics, right? Uh, They don't understand evolution and they're warmongering bigots. But here is where it gets interesting. Finally, perceived similarity to animals, a construct distinct from belief in evolution, study number six, partially mediated the link between belief in evolution and prejudice, studies number seven and eight. Even when controlling for religious beliefs, political views, and other demographic variables, and were also observed for non-dominant groups, i.e. religious and racial minorities. So in study number six, they controlled for religion and they observed that they could lessen the link between understanding evolution and bigotry by looking at how subjects saw humans as being similar to animals or vice versa. The researchers wrap up all this by saying, overall, these findings highlight the importance of belief in human evolution as a potentially key individual difference variable predicting racism and prejudice. So what does this all mean? Well, this is actually just one study to add to a pile of research that suggests that when people see non-human animals as part of our shared history, when we relate to those animals, when we acknowledge our similarities with those animals, when we see them as sentient beings who deserve respect, when we see non-human animals as being in some way equal to ourselves, we're also more likely to view other humans as sentient beings who are equal to ourselves. If you've paid any attention to any lesson about any era of world history, you'll know that a common way to engender hatred against a group of humans is to portray them as animals who are beneath us real humans. Philosopher David Livingston Smith wrote about the history of dehumanization and its necessity to genocide in his book, Less Than Human. And he describes situations like Nazis referring to Jewish people as Untermenschen, 
Hutus calling Tutsis cockroaches, slavers referring to Africans as soulless apes. Humans have an innate psychological aversion to murdering and subjugating one another, but they can overcome that by telling themselves that the humans they are murdering or subjugating aren't really human at all. There's something less than human, less than us. Now, what if there were a group of humans who understand that humans are not the pinnacle of four billion years of evolution, that we are just another step along a path, no better or worse than the step before or the step after? And what if this group of people fervently believed that, in fact, there is no animal whose life is worth less than a human? Now, this is a strict hypothetical because this group doesn't exist the way I've described. Even the strictest vegan enlists a hierarchy of value. We have to do that because otherwise, at this point in our history, we simply can't survive. Whether it's slapping a mosquito that bites you, killing the insects trying to feed on our crops, or even the act of pulling up and eating those crops themselves. All life on Earth exists on a spectrum, and we all make a judgment call on what life is morally okay to snuff out so that our life can continue on. But if there were such a group that values all life as being equal, then it would be far more difficult to dehumanize another human. What are they, an ape, a cockroach? Well, what's wrong with apes and cockroaches? All beings have value. Hell, I recently read Siddhartha, and um, the author basically makes the same argument for inanimate objects. Siddhartha couldn't even dehumanize someone by calling them a rock. You know, rocks are cool as shit. That's my Sparks note, Notes review of Siddhartha. You're welcome if you're in high school and don't want to read it. Now, we may unfortunately not have many Siddharthas on the planet, but we do have a lot of humans who exist along that spectrum, somewhere in between all molecules have worth and only humans matter. And understanding evolution may be a key step in what I consider to be the right direction. That is the end of the spectrum where humans tend to have a big picture view of their place in the universe, where their own egos are kept in check, where they aren't necessarily considering themselves to be the chosen people made in God's own image and then given all of the earth and its inhabitants to name and rule over. That's why I think things got interesting in that sixth study. Someone might not understand evolution because they were never taught it or it goes against their religion, but they might still see non-human animals as something similar to humans. And sure enough, that idea did make them less likely to be bigoted towards other humans. This directly backs up previous research, like this study from 2010, in which researchers found that subjects who saw less of a stark divide between humans and non-human animals were less likely to hold prejudices against immigrants. In a follow-up in that study, they found that subjects who read scientific editorials stressing how human-like some animals could be were then more likely to, and I quote, see immigrants, a human outgroup, as significantly more human, a process we call rehumanization. But it also boosted their empathy for immigrants and their sense that immigrants share much in common with Canadians, the host society, and reduced their prejudices against immigrants. And that's even though the editorials they read had nothing to do with immigrants. The lead researcher of that study cited psychologist Scott Plaus of Wesleyan University, who wrote, the very act of treating people like animals would lose its meaning if animals were treated well. While speciesism is clearly very different from racism and sexism and other forms of bigotry against humans, Plaus writes that many of the psychological factors that underlie speciesism serve to reinforce and promote prejudice against humans. These factors include power, privilege, dominance, control, entitlement, and the need to reduce cognitive dissonance when committing harmful acts. 
As always, you can find a link to the transcript for this video in the box down below. And in that transcript, I provide links to all of the studies and editorials that I've mentioned here. I mention that because uh, I know that once I read that initial study, I fell into a really interesting rabbit hole reading about the various connections between animal welfare, empathy for our fellow humans, and our own understanding of humanity's place in the universe. Oh, also, by the way, read Siddhartha. Um, it's really great. You can even read it for free right now, thanks to Project Gutenberg, but only if you are in the United States and some other countries where the copyright is considered to be expired. You know, you, you got to be careful of those corporate lawyers, those rats. Oh.